So in a previous video, I talked about how the oxygen and carbon dioxide are quantified by their partial pressures. For this video, I want to give just a quick tour of the partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide at various areas of the respiratory system. So beginning with the inspired air, which is typically atmospheric air, at sea level, the barometric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Because the atmospheric air is 21% oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen is approximately 160 millimeters of mercury. Although there is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is insignificant for mammals, certainly not insignificant if you're a plant or a coral. So I have it indicated here that there are trace amounts of carbon dioxide. So during inspiration, this atmospheric air is first moving into the upper respiratory tract and then the conducting airways within our lungs. Right away, we observe that the partial pressure of oxygen drops from 160 millimeters of mercury to 150 millimeters of mercury. What accounts for this drop in the partial pressure of oxygen? This occurs due to the humidification of the air that takes place in the upper respiratory tract in the conducting airways. As the inspired air is being humidified, the other constituents of that air, chiefly nitrogen and oxygen, are diluted by a small amount. The carbon dioxide is also diluted by a small amount, but because there's only a tiny little bit there, there's still only a trace amount of carbon dioxide in this tracheal air. Most of the air during inspiration ultimately makes its way down into the respiratory airways and mixes with the alveolar air. The partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolar air is 100 millimeters of mercury, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 40 millimeters of mercury. This is the component of air within the lungs that is able to directly communicate with the blood within the pulmonary capillaries. Blood is being supplied to the pulmonary capillaries via the pulmonary artery, which is pumped to the lungs via the right ventricle. The pulmonary arterial blood is relatively low in oxygen and relatively high in CO2, partial pressures of 40 and 46 millimeters of mercury respectively. This makes sense because this blood has already perfused the systemic circulation where it's unloaded its oxygen and picked up the excess carbon dioxide from the metabolically active tissues. So once this pulmonary arterial blood reaches the pulmonary capillaries, we have two partial pressure gradients that are facilitating the exchange of gases between the alveolar air and the pulmonary capillaries. We have an oxygen partial pressure gradient which favors the movement of oxygen from the alveolar air into the pulmonary capillaries. And then we have a carbon dioxide partial pressure gradient, which favors the unloading of carbon dioxide into the alveolar air. Notice that by the time the blood leaves the pulmonary capillaries and enters the venous side of the pulmonary circulation, which is on its way back to the left side of the heart, full equilibration has occurred typically between the alveolar air and the pulmonary circulation. That is, the pulmonary venous blood has a PO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury and a PCO2 of 40 millimeters of mercury. So it matches the gas composition of the alveolar air. Remember, this blood that's the pulmonary venous blood that's returning to the left heart is what will eventually become the systemic arterial blood, which will make its way back out to the tissues around the body. And to quickly complete this story, upon expiration, the gas composition of the expired air has a PO2 of 120 millimeters of mercury and a PCO2 of 32 millimeters of mercury. You might be wondering how it is that we go from 100 millimeters of mercury of oxygen in the alveolar air to an increase to 120. Same with why is it that the PCO2 decreases from 40 to 32 comparing the alveolar air to the expired air. The expired air is the average of all the expired air, which includes the dead space air left in the conducting airways at the end of inspiration. So remember, during inspiration, most of the air reaches the alveolar spaces and participates in gas exchange. Some fraction of that air is left in the conducting airways, does not participate in gas exchange, and, and maintains that gas composition of the tracheal air, the high PO2 of 150 and then the really low PCO2. So again, this expired air is really just a mix of that alveolar air and the tracheal air, which was the dead space air. So there you have it. There's a tour of the partial pressures at critical points within the respiratory system. The critical take-home point here is the relationship between 
the gas composition of the alveolar air and how those values determine the gas composition of the pulmonary venous blood, which is ultimately going to determine the gas composition of the systemic arterial blood. In future videos, I'll look at how it is that the gas composition of the systemic arterial blood is monitored by chemoreceptors, and if deviations from normal exist, where carbon dioxide levels are, say, too high or too low, or oxygen levels are too low, that those can be corrected for by modulating ventilation, thereby affecting the gas composition of the alveolar air.